Good morning, everybody. We're going to talk about all things sake this morning. Um, and I'm just going to, we have five people presenting and I'm going to kind of have each one of them introduce themselves and talk a little bit about themselves. Um, I am Jess Weber. I am a forensic scientist at the BCA and I am the sake site coordinator. Jude, do you want to go? Sure. My name is Jude Foster, and I am the statewide medical forensic policy program senior coordinator at the Minnesota Coalition Against Sexual Assault and the Sexual Violence Justice Institute. And my role on the statewide SACI grant is I am the MDT coordinator. Uh, I'll go next. Uh, my name is Detective Chris Johnson. I am with the Noka County Sheriff's Office. And uh, we are the pilot agency for the Minnesota Saki Project. I can go. Uh, my name is Vanessa Ellingson. I am the advocate uh, with Alexandra House here in Anoka County. And I, uh, with my position for the Saki Project, I am embedded in Anoka County Sheriff's Office. And I'm Sam Schmidt. I am the Saki uh, Project Specialist at the Minnesota Coalition Against Sexual Assault. I will also be your accessibility and tech wizard for this presentation. So don't hesitate to ask if you need help either by email or by chat. I'm happy to, to assist any way I can. Okay. So just a disclaimer here, the uh, the views and the presentation are strictly for the state of Minnesota and the Saki grant that we received. This is not necessarily the viewpoint of the Department of Justice. So just keep that in mind. This is specific to the state of Minnesota. So the just talking about in general about the Minnesota Saki grant, um, this is a Minnesota Sexual Assault Kit Initiative grant um, in 2018, the um, D, uh, Minnesota Office of Justice Programs was awarded $2 million for to address the issue of untested sex assault kits. So to rewind a little bit, in 2015, the BCA conducted a um, statewide inventory of every agency and how many kits they had in their possession. So this was kits that weren't submitted to for testing for whatever reason. So they submitted a list, each agency submitted a list of what kits they had in their possession and the reason that they weren't submitted for testing. So our goal with this grant was to not only test the kits, but to also understand why kits weren't being submitted, what the issues and challenges regarding the collection and the processing of kits was to get a bigger, broader idea of what we could do um, to improve statewide sexual assault response in the state of Minnesota. So this slide is just an illustration showing the distinct roles of each project partner working on the Saki project and ways that we work together. Each member has a distinct role outside of the MDT or multidisciplinary team, but each partner brings their own set of knowledge and expertise to the group. And together we set expectations for how we're gonna work together. Um, we develop best practices and guidelines. Sometimes we call that protocol. Um, we perform case review to discuss the nuances of specific cases that emerge out of the Saki project. And finally, we perform outreach to agencies and organizations to provide support and share information about Saki and our de and developments in Saki as a whole. Uh, together, we share an interest in and strive to be more victim survivor centered and trauma informed in our practice. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about just uh, the Noka County um, kits that were accumulated and why that happened. Uh, our, our inventory is going to be specific to Anoka County, but I'm sure that a lot of the same reasons that we accumulate them are the same reasons that uh, other agencies are going to be accumulating them as well. Uh, and I think the general impression out there is that if it's an untested kit, that means that was an uninvestigated crime. And that's, that's, not the case for Anoka County anyway. The vast majority of our kits were kits where uh, the case maybe was invest fully investigated and during the course of investigation, either the suspect fully admitted to the sexual assault or uh, at least two portions of it, making it a consent case. And 
we felt in Anoka County that back in 2015 anyway and prior that we didn't, weren't gonna test those kits because there was limited value and that wasn't gonna help us determine consensual issues. Now the reason was a sexual assault report was ruled unfounded. That could mean either after the initial statement with the victim, the elements of the crime weren't met. Uh, you know, we believe something happened, but it didn't quite rise to that level or through the investigation, it was ruled that it didn't occur the way it was said or uh, proved to be actually false. Or we didn't test them because it had limited evidentiary value. An example of this would be uh, a kit where it was just a touch case, maybe a touching over the clothing where they did a kit, but we didn't think that it would necessarily have much value to test it. We wouldn't expect to have results or at least results are gonna help if it was just over the clothing touching without some penetration or ejaculation or something like that. In Anoka County, we do have some, or did have some restricted kits. Uh, we generally didn't have the protocol set up to, to hold them here, but there was a few hospitals generally in Hedham County where we had the protocol set up so that we could house them here. So obviously we're not gonna test restricted unreported kits. And this, this one is a little bit trickier because a lot of times, as, as you all know, the victims will, will drop off uh, after initial statements. And generally we weren't gonna test those unless we were deep into the process. Um, it could be that the, the, the victim just stopped responding to us or actually communicated with us that they did not want it to go forward. So we wouldn't test that kit, we would honor their wishes. And this is the biggest problem. There's some cases where we just don't know why. Um, there's some cases where we should have tested and we didn't, and we got to own that. Uh, we have one case where uh, we actually have it charged and it was a 14 year old who said that her friend's mother's boyfriend sexually assaulted her and it was actually charged, but there was some initial investigation done by the defense attorney's office that questioned her credibility. So the defense or prosecution didn't think they could move forward, but we never tested the kit. And it's not clear why we didn't test the kit. Uh, I think this was an oversight, but those reasons aren't stated in any documentation. So we tested it, lo and behold, we have the evidence and now we have it charged again. So some are just gonna be oversight. Some, we just screwed up. We should have tested, didn't. It could be whether the detective didn't quite believe the victim, didn't believe the credibility. Um, but we have to own those mistakes where we see that we should have tested it and didn't. We got to test it now and own up to our mistakes. And then this is a big problem. We have a lot of missing files, especially when you go back prior to 2002, 2001, it's hard to uh, know why it wasn't tested. There's the whole case file is missing or there's incomplete uh, records. So you piece it together the best you can, but sometimes you don't know why it's not tested. So it's hard to make a decision for that kit without that information. And homicide cases in Noka County, we generally take the sex assault exam kit for all homicides, whether they think it's sexual assault related or not, just because that's the last opportunity we're gonna have to collect that. So we did collect those. Some we have tested, but back then we didn't, well, we still don't, uh, but that may be changing. So early on in this process, we, uh, we had to get these decisions made on what we're gonna test and what we're not gonna test. And, and everybody does it different. Duluth was the first person to have a Saki grant in the state of Minnesota in 2016. And, and they did a forklift approach is what they call it, where they, they test it all. Um, that worked for them and that's awesome. But we got together with our MDT, which was Anoka County Sheriff's Office, Mincasa, BCA, same programs and Alexander House. But then later we determined that we needed to get prosecution on board because there's other issues that we didn't think about that only they're gonna realize. So we determined that we're gonna test all except for the following few exceptions. Restricted, unreported, we're still not gonna test those and state law now is that we still don't even with the new law in 20, passed in 2020. Cases where the suspect was charged and convicted and we have an offender sample on file. 
So we determined there was really no need to test that. We got everything we could want out of that test, a conviction, actually serving time. Um, so very little, we actually no benefit to testing it. But there were some cases where they were charged, convicted, but they did not have to give an offender sample. So there, there's nobody in code, there's no profile in CODA. So we did decide to test those few cases. Homicide cases, we, uh, we're still not gonna test those unless they were unsolved, which we have. Um, we tested several that were unsolved. One, we have a profile for a male that we, from a vaginal swab. So that's actually our oldest kit, 1985 kit. So we've actually reopened that and we unfortunately have no CODIS profile in that case. No, if there's a sexual assault or not, but it's obviously new evidence that's good to us. Uh, so we're probably gonna be doing some genetic genealogy with that. Uh, we're still trying to figure that out. But generally we're not gonna test the homicides if they're solved, people are already serving time. We felt that the benefits of testing it uh, are not enough to create potential problems in the case when the case is resolved and put to bed and now we're going to test it and we may now have more discoverable evidence for a defense attorney to look at uh, unless we felt there was really a reason to we're not going to we're not going to test those we're going to let those lay and a few cases with unique circumstances uh, I mean every case is different so we try to set guidelines but once in a while a case will pop up that you have to discuss with the committee kind of determine what you're going to do with it most of those, the ones that I'm talking about are where the victim up front was very clear that they did not want to move forward with uh, an investigation or testing. And that's either documented very well recorded even. Um, so we're going to honor those wishes. But most of those cases where they stopped moving forward or stopped communicating, we were going to test those. But it had to be an MDT decision not to test in those circumstances. And all our cases are going to be reviewed by me and at least uh, an advocate, which would be Vanessa, who you'll be hearing from briefly, um, if it's not going to move on to our subcommittee. So at least it's more than one set of eyes looking at the case. So as far as the submission of kits go. It's going to follow a pretty typical evidence submission, um, your, your normal go-to how you would submit evidence to the BCA, except that we want you to ensure that the word Saki is written somewhere on the submission form. It's kind of difficult for intake to determine whether these are Saki cases or whether they're current active cases, and so we just really need Saki written somewhere on that submission form. As far as filling out these submission forms for all of your um, untested kits, we know that this could be um, a burden if you have, you know, let's say you have 100 kits, filling out 100 submission forms is, is tedious. So we have streamlined it a little bit that we have said you don't need to fill out that narrative section at the bottom unless there's something that is very unusual about the case that you think the scientists would need to know for testing. But other than that, you can just fill out the top section of the submission form for each kit and then leave that narrative blank or red. that's a good place to put the Saki on there. Right now, our Saki grant that we have currently does not cover toxicology kits and it does not cover secondary evidence. So if you have the blood and urine kits or underwear or clothing or bedding associated with these kits, we are not accepting those at this time. Um, we will test the kits and then we can have that conversation if you feel like there's um, evidence that needs to be tested or you would like further evidence tested, we can, you can contact me and we can talk through the, your options at that point. So um, if, you, if you can, if you could coordinate with us when you would like to submit your kits, that would be the best. Um, if you have a large amount of kits, we need to know when they're coming in so that it's not a surprise. There's 200 kits at our door that we weren't expecting. Um, if we haven't gotten, if you haven't been contacted, if your agency hasn't been contacted yet, don't worry, we're coming. Um, it's just we haven't gotten to your agency yet on our list, but don't worry, you're, you're on the list and you will be contacted shortly. So um, if you've been working with Jason Simser, keep working with Jason Simser to submit kits. If you haven't been working with anybody and you need to submit kits and we've already contacted you, um, please, you can contact me. My contact stuff will be at the end. Um, but please coordinate with us when you'd like to drop those kits off and we'll get that um, ironed out and as efficient as possible. 
The one thing that we really don't want you to do is to submit random kits when you're done reviewing them. Like let's say your agency has 50 kits and you're like, okay, well, we've reviewed five of them. We'll send those five in. And then two months from now, you send in another five and another five. We really want to keep your agency's kits all together so we can say, okay, out of the 50, you're sending in 35 and we have the reason for the other ones that aren't being sent in. So we can kind of wrap up your agency all at once. So we can say, here's the numbers from Otter Tail County and here's what this is looking like and, and kind of tie it up with a bow. So we know what, what we're doing instead of bouncing around from agency to agency. So please coordinate with me or Jason if you're already working with him to get those kits to the BCA. So as far as testing results for Anoka County, again, this is just Anoka County, so this is not for the entire state, but we would, um, you know, it gives us some insight in what we might expect to see if we extrapolated out over the entire state of Minnesota. So they had 498 kits that they um, had found on their, or had on their original 2015 inventory. And then there was three that they found um, after the fact when they were going through all of these kits in their storage. Don't be surprised if that happens to your agency too. Just call me and we'll work through that. Um, in the end, they decided to test 401 of these kits and 97 were determined not to need testing. And Chris kind of went over some of the reasons why those won't be, won't be tested. And then out of those kits, we had 164 of them stop at quant, which basically just means that there is not enough male DNA to continue testing. So typically our victims are female and the males or the suspects are males. And so a lot of our cases, we are looking for male DNA on a female kit. So if there's not enough male DNA, then the testing will stop right there, which it ended up being about 41% of our cases stopped at that testing. So we did not get a profile off of those kits. Out of the kits that we did get profiles out of, we uploaded um, 179 profiles into CODIS. And then of those 179, profiles, 72 of them hit to a, 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 either a case or a convicted offender in CODIS. So that ends up being about 40% of our profiles that we entered did end up hitting in CODIS. So of these CODIS hits, 56 of them were convicted offender hits. So they hit directly from the evidence, um, the evidence profile hit to a convicted offender that was in the database for a felony level offense. Four of them were forensic hits, which means that it hit to another case. So a profile in this case hit to a profile in this case, but they aren't necessarily hit to a convicted offender at that point. And then 12 of them hit to both a convicted offender and a forensic hit, which just again means that it hit to a convicted offender and it also hit to another case that that offender is associated with. And then of the um, 72 total CODIS hits, 22 of them hit to someone other than the listed suspect, which um, at first glance, that seems really, really high, but there might not have been a listed suspect in the case. So those counted as hit to a, a someone other than the listed suspect if there isn't a listed suspect. So, um, so again, these are just investigative leads done through CODIS. All right, so Chris mentioned that Detective Johnson mentioned earlier about the testing um, subcommittee that we put together to decide to kind of determine as a group which um, cases would go for testing. Once we determined that, we did um, kind of evolve into a case review subcommittee. So that still involved um, the same members. It was Minkasa, um, Anoka County Sheriff's Office, Alexandra House, uh, we had SANE involved, uh, a local SANE involved on that, and also um, we brought in, like you mentioned, the uh, county attorney's office. So we were all put together um, reviewing these cases as they come, came back from the lab, from the BCA, and uh, we were determining which we would notify, um, how we came to that decision, and what kind of notification, we did break it down. Um, Anoka County decided to do two different types of noti notification. Um, so we had active notification and opt-in, opt-out notification. Um, 
we did uh, we determined active notification to be where we would uh, I would take measures as the uh, advocate with Alexander House to actively notify um, the victims in these cases, which just means um, we had to make decisions then from there on what measures we would take, um, the different ways that we would attempt to notify. Uh, and then if we weren't doing that, we did leave the rest open for uh, our opt-in opt-out notification where you'll see they do break down a little further here. So there's the active notification and then the next one is uh, opt in, opt out. So we did create um, just through research and, and best practices and research into uh, Saki projects across the country and also Duluth was very helpful. Um, looking at their program, we did create an opt in, opt out notification helpline. So that was a helpline that rings directly to me, to my uh, office line here at the sheriff's office. And it goes to a recording that then says, um, there's information on there about uh, a little bit about the Saki project and that victim survivors calling that line can um, leave their information, name, contact number. And um, if they would prefer you know, if they heard about Saki out in the community, through a different community organization, through local law enforcement, um, or different, we, several of our agencies, Alex House, the Sheriff's Office, Minkasa has a uh, banner on the website about Saki and what we're doing and just trying to get the word out. So if they, if victim survivors had heard about Saki, um, this number was posted and they could call this number and let us know, hey, I have a, a sexual assault um, case at Anoka County Sheriff's Office from 2002. Um, this is my name, this is my contact number. I'd like, I'd like you to reach out to me. Or um, we included opt out. So letting people know they could call and say, hey, you know, I've heard about this project. I don't wanna talk about this. Don't contact me, you know, about my 2006 case. Uh, with the active notification protocol, like I said, there was uh, lots of decisions to kind of be made. Then what we thought would work best with our community, um, with a population of victim survivors, we were looking at from those uh, 401 kits that we sent for testing. Um, we did, it's hard to kind of have a blanket statement as far as who we're gonna notify, who we're not gonna notify and why, um, just because Every victim survivor is different. Every case is different. And now, you know, minimum for five years now, up to, like Chris said, you know, the oldest was that 1985 homicide. So it's hard to say uh, now with our team together what a blanket statement over what would be best. But we were able to come up with a few guiding principles on why we were actively trying to notify these victim survivors. The first one um, is we wanted to be able to provide some sort of new information. Obviously the victim survivor went through this with the original, um, at the time of the assault with the original report, we wanted to um, be able to reach out to them now. Obviously there is likely to be some level of re-traumatization with, with reaching out again about this assault they went through. Um, so with that, we wanted to be able to provide some sort of new information for them. Another one is um, in the reviewing process that Detective Johnson um, or the law enforcement involved felt there was more investigation that could be done or um, some new information that could be found through the testing of the kit um, that would you know, most likely change the direction of the case from where it was left previously. Uh, we did determine in all our discussions that if, if this kit was tested and it came back with a hit in the database, so it, it tied to CODIS to an unknown suspect um, or even a CODIS hit to the listed suspect in the original report, um, we most likely would want to actively notify that person, but we also, we typically also wanted uh, new information to provide to 
to that person because at the original report, um, this victim survivor reported that it was, you know, the known suspect at the time. That wouldn't be new information for them. We wouldn't be, you know, we'd be calling them 10, 10 years down the road, um, telling them something they already knew. So that new information piece was pretty big. We wanted to be able to, you know, if we're um, coming back into their lives with this, with this case, with this report, we wanted to be able to provide some new information to them. If it was clearly documented in the report at the time, um, whether it was through the statement or through the officer's report, um, that the victim, you know, was reporting it, was talking to the detective, um, did the same exam, uh, got the kit collected, but they didn't want to go further at the time, if that was pretty clear in the report um, or pretty clear in the transcript of the statement, we did decide as a group to honor that victim's wishes. Um, again, with the hope that if they heard of Saki some other way or media or whatever, um, and maybe at the time they didn't want to go forward, but they're interested to at least have conversation now, they would then utilize that uh, opt-in, opt-out helpline. So we put together, um, put together a little graph here. I know it is kind of small, hopefully you can see it. I'll, I'll kind of talk about it too, but uh, some takeaways from notification so far. So uh, with the active notification, um, these are what our numbers look like to date. They haven't, um, nothing new in the last couple of days since this, this was put together, but um, I have actively notified 42 of our victims, victim survivors in our cases. Um, I've also, if you want to talk about located, I, I have located an additional four, um, and that just means, as far as tracking, that just means we believe we have the best current contact info for them. Um, we just aren't getting any contact back, whether it's phone number, um, letter, email, Facebook reach out, which we can, um, that's certainly a question too, if you wanna talk about further uh, the methods we use, those are some of the methods we use to reach out to victims. Um, it was primarily phone, was our first, first attempt. Um, would hopefully be by phone, but we did utilize emails, letters, social media reach out. Um, it's it's definitely getting creative and thinking outside the box and trying to find um, victim survivors from, like I said, six to 20 plus years ago. So um, 42 notified, uh, located 46. There are four victim survivors that are in the process of that we're actively working with as far as um, Detective Johnson might still be doing some investigation, um, trying to locate people to talk to, um, getting, uh, like for example, in the in the charge case, he had to go and get a you know another um, DNA swab just to confirm. Um, so there's four that we're kind of in the actively working with uh, process. Of those 42, 23 uh, victim survivors have told me that they do not want to go forward um, with any new conversations about their report. Uh, and I know um, that can be tough on the law enforcement uh, side. Some of those were definitely cases that looked like they either had more investigation that could be done or this testing in the kit would, def would take the case in a, a different direction. Um, but again, we're, we're reaching out to victims if they don't want to go forward it doesn't matter <laughs> necessarily, you know, how good the case looks. It's, it's, um, this is definitely victim driven and we're trying to be as trauma informed as possible. So if the victim does not want to go forward, that's where we're leaving that case. Um, there are four other victim survivors that I've contacted and I'm waiting to hear back from. So that just means I've done the initial notification as far as this is what Saki is. This is why we're reaching out to you. Um, and then they had requested time to think about it or process it and get back to me. And so I'm still waiting for four of those. Uh, there are 37 individuals that I am still looking to actively notify, um, which means running down contact information, trying any numbers I can find, emails I can find, um, 
mailing letters, looking at uh, DMV records, trying to find the most current contact information we can find and then trying to get a hold of them. So there's 37 of those. There are eight, um, eight that we decided to have determined to actively notify. And we feel like we have made several attempts with what we determined is the most current contact information and are not, did not hear back from um, those we've kind of closed out as far as actively looking for, for but again, if they reach out and, and would like to move forward, we certainly can at that time. Um, we've sent four to the county attorney's office that did uh, receive a case declination, a declination letter, so contacted, they wanted to move forward additional investigation was done if there was any to be done. And that was sent to the attorney's office and got a declination letter. Um, I think that covers all of them. Um, and then yes, the one that we did send for a charging decision and is currently charged at the attorney's office. Okay, so how did we get here? Why, why is there a statewide Saki grant um, it all kind of started in 2015 when the Minnesota State Legislature um, asked the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension to do a statewide inventory of all of the unsubmitted kits. So in 2015, law enforcement agencies um, kind of counted their kits and talked about why they didn't send them in. And at that time, uh, there were 3,487 kits um, in that accumulation of unsubmitted kids. Um, as uh, Jess has mentioned before and Chris has mentioned before, other kids have popped up. So, um, and if that happens to you, don't be alarmed. It's happening to a lot of law enforcement agencies across the state. So in 2016, Duluth received the first sexual assault kit initiative or SACI grant in the state of Minnesota. And they began uh, testing those kits and investigating and doing victim notification. And then in 2018, uh, we had a pretty significant change um, in our law. Uh, the first thing that we did is we defined what a restricted and an unrestricted kit was. So we had common language because in some parts of the state, they were talking about restricted kits as anonymous kits. In other communities, they were calling them Jane Doe kits. So we came up with some language just so we all were on the same page. Um, that legislation um, directed that all kits must be submitted to a crime lab within 60 days. And I should back up also law enforcement was supposed to be picking up these kits from hospitals within 10 days. Um, but in terms of submitting to a crime lab within 60 days, some of those kits were deemed to have no evidentiary value. Um, so if that was the case, law enforcement had to have a documented conversation with their county attorney about why those kits weren't being sent in. Um, so it, actually in 2018, the state of Minnesota received a grant, but those grant funds were not released until 2019. So uh, the Office of Justice Programs, which is housed in the Department of Public Safety is our fiscal agent. And uh, the grant partners are now the Anoka County Sheriff's Office, the Anoka County Attorney's Office, Alexandra House, the Minnesota Coalition Against Sexual Assault, and the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. Um, why Anoka? We decided to pilot in Anoka County because, to be honest, we didn't know what we didn't know. We we, we still don't know what we don't know. Um, so we wanted to pilot in Anoka County and um, try to identify the barriers that we were facing, um, look at our mistakes, um, look at our successes so we could share that with the rest of the state. And then much to many of our surprise, uh, in 2020, the sexual assault kit reform legislation actually passed in the bonding bill. And believe me, at Mincasa, we were just as shocked as everybody else. So starting January 1 in um, 2021, um, there have been some shifts. So the BCA, which this is fantastic because we've been talking to the BCA about this for years. The BCA said that they will hold 
uh, restricted kits for up to 30 months. Um, again, um, those tax kits, uh, secondary evidence cannot be stored at this time, um, but they are holding those kits, which is fantastic. Um, now the legislation talks about all kits just have to be sent in to the BCA. There, there's no um, discretion on what kits shouldn't be and, and um, should be. And then um, stay tuned. Um, the legislation also talks about uh, the BCA uh, creating a um, statewide kit tracking system. Um, and that will be created, I have been told, by the end of the year and uh, will be implemented soon. So obviously there's still challenges that we're trying to sort through and uh, some of you guys out there are just starting this project and, and discovering some of the challenges, but uh, here are a few of them that we're dealing with. Funding and staffing is probably gonna be the biggest. Uh, Noka County was the pilot project and with us being the pilot, we get funding for that. I'm an additional body in my unit, so that not taken away from my unit because there's still plenty of work to be done on that end. But how do we address that at a statewide level? For some, it's not going to be uh, very difficult at all. You know, you got two, three kits, no problem. But the tier one, tier two agencies, you know, who have, you know, more than a hundred or what? What do you? How do you do this? Where do you get your bodies? Do you just do it on the side? or you dedicate somebody, but then you're taken away from the rest of your unit. So those are issues that you guys are gonna to have to deal with. And if you have any uh, questions on how to do that, you know, some maybe some funding mechanisms out there, please uh, give me a call or anybody else and we can try to help you do that. But it's, it's a full-time job for me. Obviously we had, you know, almost 500 kits and most of you don't have that many, but it's hard to do it on the side as just an additional project to your already too heavy a caseload. So that's an ongoing problem. Records and record keeping practices, like I said before, uh, I got cases that I, I just don't know. Uh, you know, we've changed record management systems several times. I don't have access to reports. They're sitting in a box somewhere in a whole different building, which I've never even been in. So I, ha I had to learn our systems from the past to figure out how I can best deal with these cases. And sometimes I just can't. Some are just gone. Uh, you're not, and it's not going to be recovered. So you're going to have to deal with those. And also use that opportunity to look how you could change your procedures so that things don't get missed and improve your record management system. Locating victims and survivors, uh, Vanessa talked about that. And it's especially difficult uh, with female victims. Obviously, as life goes on, some get married, some get divorced, uh, names change. And if you're talking a, a kit from you know, 1996, you, you may have a lot of trouble finding out uh, new contact information and, you know, they could be out of state. You might have to pull in some other agencies to help you, but that's an ongoing battle. Additional kits. Um, this is going to happen if you, at least if you have a substantial uh, inventory. We here in Oka County found additional kits from our 2015 inventory. Uh, back last year, we found three, three additional and uh, just recently, a couple of weeks ago, we found four more uh, that were, you know, oddball cases. They were stored a little bit differently or labeled wrong that they weren't readily accessible. So don't be surprised if you find more kits and, and don't worry about it. Just, just get them tested. Um, you will find some. And destroyed kits. In 2015, that, that inventory was, you know, five, six years ago now. So a lot of things can change in six years. So we are finding kits that were part of the 2015 inventory that are now destroyed for various reasons. Some, I know we've had uh, the evidence was damaged for flooding or the property room had some issues. Uh, so there are kits that are missing. So we have to account for that. It's not a problem. Hopefully we don't have too many, but uh, we'll be able to work with you on that. And additional testing. I think uh, Jess said this earlier, the grant only covers right now for testing of the kit. So there are gonna be times where you, you have a case that's, you know, it's got some legs, you think you could do something with it um, and you want other things tested, the clothing, bedding, uh, whatever it may be. They will not be tested under Saki, but that doesn't mean that we're not gonna test it. The BCA will work with you, just uh, they're gonna have to test it through the traditional route 
versus going through the SACI funds. And I just wanted to clarify one thing quickly on the, um, for toxicology kits, those are being accepted with the restricted kits. They're just not being accepted with the SACI kits. So to keep them separate in your head, if you're, if you're submitting restricted kits, you can, you can submit the tox kits and the biological kits together for storage at the BCA. However, if you're submitting SACI kits, we, at this time we only are accepting just the biological kit. And so that's kind of the end of the information element of the presentation. Here are all the presenters' names and um, contact information. Um, feel free to take that down. We can also copy and paste it into the chat. But now we're going to be moving into the discussion element of this call. We'll have four breakout rooms, each with a Saki project partner available as a resource to you. Uh, the breakout rooms are a good opportunity to talk about specific issues that your community is facing or problem solve with other agencies, or maybe just ask questions of the resource person in each room. There'll be a couple people in each room. Um, is Nate Stummy with us today, June? Um, if he is here, he will be a resource in the um, prosecution group. Um, Vanessa, um, the Saki coordinator with Alex House, and Jude Foster from Mencasa will be in the advocacy room as a resource. Chris Johnson, our Saki detective with Anoka County Sheriff's Office, will be in the law enforcement breakout room. And Jess Weber, our Saki site coordinator and forensic scientist, will be in the lab and BCA breakout room. So in a few moments, I will open up those breakout rooms, and you can select whichever room you would like to join by clicking the Join button next to the group of your choice. You can also switch rooms so you don't have to stay in one room. You can go back and forth. Um, so feel free to do that if desired. All you have to do is just click um, breakout rooms and pick a different room. The breakout rooms will last for about 20 minutes or 30 minutes, just depending on the discussion. And you'll have an opportunity to come back and debrief and ask everyone questions if it makes more sense to uh, talk about those as a large group. I will be the timekeeper for our breakout groups and I'll send a little notification message when we're getting close to the end of our time. So in a moment here, you're going to see those breakout rooms pop up. Just click join in the group of your choice. So one moment here.